The fertile fields of the Central Valley and the vast desert of the Mojave are iconic representations of Northern and Southern California. The problem is the mountains standing between the two. Bridging this divide was costly, and to link San Francisco with Los Angeles and eventually New Orleans, the Southern Pacific was incorporated in 1865. For SP construction crews, building across the valley was the easy part. However, in the foothills, things began to change. SP quickly discovered that their chosen route across the transverse range was rife with difficulty, facing earthquakes, flash floods, wildfires, and above all, a steep ruling grade, to say that SP's engineers conquered this pass would be an overstatement. Even to this day, the Mojave subdivision remains among the most challenging pieces of railroading in North America. This is the place where equipment is pushed to its absolute limits, the place where train crews face their toughest battles. This is Tehachapi. Located at the southernmost end of the Sierra Nevada in California, Union Pacific and BNSF's crossing of the Tehachapis forms the biggest choke point on two converging rivers of steel. Bakersfield lies at the southern end of the San Joaquin Valley, a large trench extending through most of Central California. The city of 400,000 serves as a base camp for both Union Pacific and BNSF's crossing of the Tehachapi Mountains. Fresh crews head south from Bakersfield, racing across the valley floor to the mouth of Caliente Creek at Bina. The tracks follow the course of Caliente Creek until Caliente proper, where they travel around a dramatic horseshoe curve before passing through the timetable stations of Bealeville and Cliff. Another pair of horseshoe curves sit just below the world-famous loop at Waylong, and upon traversing the loop, trains pass through the Tehachapi Creek Narrows through Marcel. Double track begins at Cable, and trains charge through the town of Tehachapi before arriving at the top of the grade at Summit Switch. From the summit, southbounds pass through Monolith, Cameron, and Warren before reaching Mojave. Exercising trackage rights secured in 1899, BNSF trains enter the Mojave subdivision at Kern Junction, adjacent to UP's Bakersfield Yard. The joint line continues southeasterly through McGundan and Edison before reaching Sandcut. This section of track covers 11.4 miles, with a ruling grade of 1.5%. Track speed is 60 miles an hour, and the main line is double-tracked CTC. Southern Pacific construction crews reached Bakersfield in 1874, though their tracks were not technically in the town proper. Due to the city's location in the Kern River floodplain, SP's engineers chose to build their terminal a mile and a half to the east of Bakersfield, leaving the community unserved by rail. Sumner, named after Senator Charles Sumner, was chosen as the name for this faux Bakersfield. While it was later renamed to Kern, Bakersfield eventually merged with the town in 1910, and today, the former community lives on only in name. Sumner Street lies just south of one of the last remaining railroad structures on the Mojave subdivision, SP's Bakersfield Depot. The station, built in 1875, hosted SP passenger trains and served as a terminal for streetcar line Bakersfield and Kern Electric Railway until the trolleys were scrapped and the San Joaquin Daylight called here for the last time in 1971. When the SP was merged into the Union Pacific system in 1996, the station was retained as a critical facility for running trains over the mountains. Until recently, the structure served as a crew change point for Union Pacific trains and headquarters for local maintenance of weight crews. Bakersfield marks a boundary between Union Pacific's Los Angeles and Roseville service units. Crews running north of here take the Fresno subdivision to Stockton and the end of the crew district at Roseville, while southbound crews typically run to West Colton Yard or LATC in Los Angeles. While the station remains quiet between freights, it isn't hard to imagine a crowd of passengers waiting for the arrival of a streamliner not too long ago. If the mental image of passenger action isn't enough to scratch that itch, one only needs to move a few blocks south to the Bakersfield Amtrak station. While no longer a stop for Santa Fe's San Francisco Chief or Golden Gate, the station, opened on July 4, 2000, plays host to a flood of Amtrak California passenger trains racing across the valley. Starting in 1974 with a single train between Oakland and Bakersfield, Amtrak has continually expanded service on the San Joaquin Corridor, with more frequent schedules providing an alternative to the parallel I-5 and State Route 99. Service south from Bakersfield has been proposed in times past, but due to congestion on Tehachapi, no regularly scheduled Amtrak train has ever traversed the Mojave subdivision. BNSF crews are probably grateful for this. Keeping schedules for priority intermodal trains out of Richmond or manifest for Modesto is significantly harder when dealing with passenger service, and as such, Amtrak trains only operate just past the limit of BNSF's Bakersfield yard.
Santa Fe had been encroaching on Southern Pacific territory for some time by the late 1890s. Two years after its arrival in Bakersfield in 1898, Santa Fe's San Francisco and San Joaquin Valley Railroad was swamped by the floodwaters that SP's terminal in Sumner had been built to avoid. But even as the railroad struggled to recover from the catastrophe, SP eyed the Santa Fe with suspicion and worry. If Santa Fe bridged the Tehachapis to connect San Francisco with its Atlantic and Pacific subsidiary, it would upset SP's monopoly in Central California. With this fear in mind, SP reacted by building east from its terminal in Mojave across the desert to block the Atlantic and Pacific from entering California at Needles. But saddled with debt from construction costs, SP's owners quickly looked to shed the line. Within a year, they leased the Needles line in exchange for a branch in Arizona and their shares in the Sonora Railway, giving Santa Fe the tracks to directly threaten their dominant position in the San Joaquin Valley. Originally, the Santa Fe set out to build their own line over the mountains, but the proposed route through the Tehachapi set to Hone Pass was expensive. SP was themselves short on cash and recognized the reduction in costs that having a second road on the pass would bring. Thus, they offered to let Santa Fe use their route across the Tehachapi Mountains. When the ink dried on January 16, 1899, Santa Fe had secured access over the pass from Bakersfield to Mojave, trackage rights that their successor, BNSF, makes good use of. BNSF trains enter the Mojave subdivision at Kern Junction. In times past, a telegraph station and tower used to be located here, but both were demolished years ago. Kern is located at the south end of UP's Bakersfield Yard, which primarily serves local industries. Kern also serves as a junction with the former SP McKittrick branch. The area around Bakersfield is rich with oil, and to tap into the vast reserves here, SP and Santa Fe built feeder lines into the surrounding territory. From Bakersfield, the Buttonwillow branch connected with the Sunset Railroad, a joint venture with the Santa Fe. At peak traffic levels in 1909, two passenger trains and numerous oil trains ran between Bakersfield and Taft at the end of the branch. While those boom times are certainly over, UP still hauls occasional unit trains of crude oil to the Plains All-American Pipeline Terminal and Levee, southwest of Bakersfield. Outside of unit trains, though, most local traffic around Bakersfield is no longer handled by the big Class 1s. In 1991, the San Joaquin Valley Railroad took over many of the local SP and Santa Fe branch lines in the Bakersfield area. Now owned by Genesee in Wyoming, the SJVR connects with both BNSF and UP in Bakersfield, with their power being a common sight idling and switching in the UP yard here. From Bakersfield, the road has trackage rights several miles south to the timetable station in Magundan, where the Arvin branch departs from the main line. Southbound BNSF trains out of Bakersfield must contact UP Dispatcher 54 to receive permission to proceed onto the Mojave subdivision. Crews will inform the dispatcher of their lead engine number, train length, and whether or not they're a key train. Key trains are trains that carry more than 20 loads of any hazardous material and have specific restrictions placed on how they can travel. For example, key trains are not allowed to move faster than 35 miles per hour through cities of 100,000 or more and can't move at speeds of more than 50 miles per hour on the main line. These restrictions are in place to prevent the accidental spillage of hazmat material. While the southbound continues to snake onto the Mojave subdivision, a westbound SJVR train from Arvin makes good use of the double-tracked junction to head into the BNSF yard. The lead engine on this train is a Knoxville Locomotive Works NZE24B, a 2019-built Tier 4 compliant road switcher built on the frame of an old NRE genset locomotive. The unit behind it is an ex-Canadian National GP40-2LW. SJVR rosters an eclectic mix of four-axle power that makes any train of theirs seen in the Bakersfield area a constant variety show. In the years before refrigerated trailers took over the transport of produce in the valley, Bakersfield Yard served as an important marshalling point for Southern Pacific trains carrying perishable goods. In the days before diesel-powered mechanical reefers, both the SP and Santa Fe yards had ice decks, wherein workers would load blocks of ice into insulated boxcars to keep produce fresh for its journey to market. Both yards also featured a roundhouse and turntable, with light repair facilities for performing inspections and spot repairs on locomotives. However, both roads moved their maintenance facilities to their respective hub yards at Colton and Barstow, leaving only a sanding rack, refueling station, and the concrete foundations of the former roundhouse. While the SP turntable also remains in place, it has not been used for many years. Even Bakersfield Station may itself soon succumb to the passage of time. In 2021, UP constructed a new office building for crew changes a block east of the old depot, and put the venerable structure on notice for demolition. While the city is attempting to preserve the building, only time will tell if it follows the fate of so many other structures on Tehachapi. The Arvin branch was another joint venture between the SP and Santa Fe. Interestingly, the roads opted to operate the 17-mile line on alternating years, with each company being able to profit from the produce grown in the Kern Mesa. Even with the line being abandoned past DiGiorgio, agriculture remains a staple on the slow-running but profitable branch. 
it's not uncommon to see SJVR power parked here, waiting to return to Bakersfield. Action on the Mojave subdivision at Magundan, however, is anything but slow running. Trains easily can reach track speed coming out of Bakersfield as they charge up the 1% grade to Sandcut. Manifest traffic on the Mojave subdivision is primarily made up of carload freight from the Central Valley, heading to UP's West Colton and BNSF's Barstow classification yards. Mixed traffic from points further north is sourced from Vancouver and Pasco, Washington, and Klamath Falls, Oregon. Almost all trains on Tehachapi rate helpers. While in times past manned helpers were added to trains at Bakersfield and Bina, radio-controlled distributed power units make up the bulk of helpers on the west side of the pass. Distributed power units, or DPUs, are run by the engineer in the lead locomotive and help prevent trains from stalling on the hill. Sets of remote engines in the rear or middle of consists provide an extra distributed boost to help combat slack action. This helps more efficiently move trains up and over the 2.52% grade to summit switch. The Bakersfield line was double-tracked between Kern Junction and Sandcut in 1922. All of this track requires constant maintenance, and large sections of the pass will be routinely shut down due to MOW crews working on ongoing projects. Mondays in particular are often scheduled by MOW crews on the line for these large projects, and appropriately are titled Maintenance Mondays. On them, crews will hold Form Bs while they work between 8am and 4pm. Requested from the dispatcher 12 hours in advance for major projects, Form Bs allow maintenance crews to hold sections of track out of service to be repaired or maintained. While these are active, trains on adjacent tracks are required to move at restricted speeds to protect workers on the ground. In double-track territory, if the centers of the tracks are more than 35 feet apart, trains can move faster than 35 miles an hour. As is the case here, however, the double-track is close enough to cause this northbound manifest for Fresno to pass at restricted speed. Edison was originally named Wade. The siding was renamed when SP built a point to offload Edison power plant equipment. The Kern River is home to several hydroelectric plants that provide electricity for the Los Angeles Basin. Meets are common on this section of track, as the UP dispatcher in San Bernardino is usually keen to get as many trains into and out of Bakersfield as possible to relieve congestion on the pass. When congestion does happen, southbounds will often be stopped between Edison and Sandcut when trains in front of them are waiting for traffic to clear ahead. Edison also lends its name to the Edison Highway, which parallels the tracks through this area. The road is a portion of old US-466, a highway that extended from Morro Bay through Las Vegas, eventually joining Route 66 in Kingman, Arizona. Today, Tehachapi Pass is bridged by California State Route 58, which follows much of 466's original alignment. Some of the fastest running trains a visiting railfan can see in the Mojave subdivision are UP's fleet of intermodals heading to and from LATC in Los Angeles. Destinations for these I and Z trains include Lathrop, California, Brooklyn Yard in Portland, and Tacoma in Seattle, Washington. Due to their expedited schedules, they're prioritized by the dispatcher, and rarely take the siding for any opposing traffic. Sandcut was originally named Sievert, and is named for the cut the tracks make into the hills here, which forms a boundary from the plateau west of Bakersfield to the outwash plain of Caliente Creek. It was here in 1872 that a pair of surveys were made by William Hood, chief engineer of the SP. Hood and his crew started their surveys at the future site of Tehachapi Loop, looping their way down along the mountains to Seifert with a 2.2% gradient. But due to the business concerns of one General David Colton, the railroad would instead push east through the Caliente Creek Narrows to the town site of Allen's Camp, where Colton hoped to exploit the arrival of the railroad and cash in on the expected property boom. To this day, the railroad remains locked into the decision made by Colton to push towards Caliente. While gentle in comparison with the severe grades trains contend with on the subdivision, Sandcut Hill has always posed a challenge for northbound crews. To avoid stalling, trains would be cut in half at Bina, with the first half being brought to Edison. The power would run back to Bina to repeat the process, putting their train back together to finish their run into Bakersfield. Given Edison's distance from Sievert, it was determined to be more efficient to create a siding just past the top of the grade, and in 1903, SB construction crews completed what was known as Travis Siding. This siding allowed northbounds to double the hill faster, but even with Travis and the eventual double tracking to Bina, SB still struggled to move trains efficiently up and over Sandcut Hill. To that end, during the Harriman era, the railroad installed automatic block semaphore signals over the subdivision. Searchlight signals like this cantilever bridge at Sandcut were later installed in the early 1940s, which provided both a utilitarian and graceful solution to signaling in double-track territory. 
Unfortunately, change is inevitable. In the fall of 2013, UP maintenance crews began refitting the entirety of the Mojave subdivision with LED signals compatible with PTC, or positive train control. Suddenly, the iconic cantilever at Sandcut was on the chopping block. By November of 2013, it, like most of the searchlight signals on the Mojave subdivision, had been taken down and scrapped. Today, trains pass by the trilights as if their cantilever forebearers never existed, as change on the Mojave subdivision continues to march onwards. But if there's one thing at Sandcut that's sure to stay the same, it's the dramatic set of curves that keep rail fans coming back to this iconic location. From Sanka, the Mojave subdivision's easy running ends as it begins to follow the path of the Caliente Creek Narrows. Double track ends at Bina, and southbounds work upgrade through Illman before reaching Caliente. Here, the tracks traverse a sweeping horseshoe curve and begin the steep ruling grade up the west slope of the mountains. Curving through Tunnel 1 above Caliente and Tunnel 2 at Allard, trains are on Run 8 as they pass through Tunnels 3 and 5 at Bealville. This section of track covers 13.7 miles with a ruling grade of 2.52%. Track speed is 23 miles per hour, and the line is mostly single-tracked. Bino was originally known as Pampa. In 1875, the Southern Pacific had reached here after expediting their construction across the valley from Sumner. Today, Bino remains the location where the main line narrows from double to single track. This is due to the tight geography of the Caliente Creek Narrows. To satisfy General Colton, the rail line closely hugged the walls of the canyon to reach the town site, leaving little more than a space for a maintenance road available. Thus, southbound trains like this BNSF manifest from Richmond often have to wait for northbound hotshots to pass before making a run up the canyon. Meets in single-track territory require crew members to step out and give a visual inspection of passing trains, known as a roll-by. If a problem is spotted, the conductor on the ground will inform the opposing train so that it can stop and inspect the issue. Once given the green from the UP dispatcher, the M. Rick bar begins its journey into the Narrows. Bina used to be home to a depot and train order office, where paper orders from a dispatcher would be handed to a train's crew to dictate their movements on the pass. In 1960, the depot was donated to the Kern County Museum, where it remains to this day. Most southbounds pass through Bina without having to add helpers. But up until the introduction of remote-controlled DPUs, SB stationed a set of engines and a pocket track here to assist trains up the climb to Summit Switch. But like the SP itself, this practice has long since gone by the wayside. Bina also lies just south of a collection point for free-range cattle farmed in the Tehachapi Mountains. Appropriately named Bina Corral, the pens are located between the tracks in Walker Basin Creek and are usually stuffed full of cows waiting for transport to slaughter. But contrary to popular belief, no slaughterhouse was ever located here. Instead, the structures located along the tracks were part of a 1961 built fertilizer plant, which had been built by Valley Nitrogen producers on the site of the Bina section camp. 
The confusion many rail fans had about the building stemmed from the Guelph Slaughterhouse and Processing sign that was painted on the south side of the complex, but this was painted for a movie set. The old factory provided both a residence for a local family and a backdrop for southbound trains, but by 2018 most of the buildings have been demolished and today only a water tank remains. The high and wide detector at Bina is another indicator of change on the pass. Where once train order office staff would manually perform roll-bys for trains passing by the depot, today computerized detectors provide the same service. This one at milepost 328.6 is both a hotbox and high-wide detector, one of two on the pass. Sensors on the detector measure the dimensions of passing trains to ensure that their cars can fit within the Mojave subdivision's many tunnels. Despite clearances on Tehachapi being improved in the 1990s to accommodate high-cube double-stack containers, measuring a train for shifted loads or oversized cars is still important to avoid damage to vital infrastructure. If the detector spots a problem, it sends out a radio alert, letting both the dispatcher and train crew know that it needs to stop and inspect the car corresponding to the axle the detector refers to. Progress on Tehachapi has also done away with code lines. Prior to the implementation of radio control in the subdivision, CTC signals from a dispatching machine would be sent to line-side equipment through wires strung up on poles, which often also carry telegraph wires for train order stations. While most tracks on the mountain are now controlled via radio signals, the portion of the line between here and Tehachapi is controlled via fiber optic wires due to the radio signals not being afforded a clear line of sight. Fittingly, with the fiber optic project being completed, this section of track was the last in the past to be controlled with code lines, with them rendered obsolete most have been taken down. South of the high-wide detector, the tracks enter into the Caliente Creek Narrows. Old US-466, which has paralleled the tracks all the way from Kern Junction, departs here to head south into the mountains on its own alignment. The highway was a major artery for the movement of migrant workers from the Dust Bowl of the 1930s, and featured prominently in John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath, as migrants used 466 to cross over the Tehachapi's to enter the Promised Land of the San Joaquin Valley. The Mojave subdivision crosses over Caliente Creek here on the somewhat austere Concrete Bridge. While mundane, its purpose is necessary for the function of the railroad through the Narrows. While it may not look it from these dry views, Caliente Creek is subject to periodic, violent flash flooding that can quickly overwhelm the right-of-way. On March 1st, 1983, after a record-setting wet season saturated the mountains with rain, a massive flash flood wiped out the main line at Bina, destroying the crossing of the creek and knocking out a signal bridge. Extensive property destruction was recorded throughout the mountains, and the Mojave subdivision was knocked out of commission for a month as crews attempted to fix the damage. This was only the latest in a series of floods, and Ilman today is a testament to the power of Caliente Creek. The roadbed through the Narrows needed to be relayed several times from its original construction. The old alignment survived as passing tracks in the canyon until Ilman and Caliente sidings were joined into a section of double track after the 1983 flood. After the flood, Southern Pacific installed these boxcar doors along the wash, along with large rocks known as riprap, to protect against high waters and erosion. Should the waters rage down Caliente Creek again, these barricades will help direct the flood away from the embankment the right-of-way is built on, preventing further washouts like the one at Bina. Another victim of the flood was Tunnel 1 Half. The short tunnel was dug to relocate the tracks away from their original 1885 alignment, which had in essence been built on the canyon floor to get to Allen's camp in as short a time as possible. While several trestles used to be located here, the repeated flooding in the canyon has long since washed away any evidence of them. Today, the cut where Tunnel 1 Half was remains, and serves as a reminder of the constant adjustment the railroad has had to make to accommodate the changes Colton made to Hood's original plan. Indeed, so certain was the general of the impossibility of climbing to Hatchby Pass from Allen's camp that construction of the line stalled for over a year. Caliente, as it was renamed, served as a terminus for the SP and a destination for gold, silver, and uranium mined around Havila, the former seat of Kern County. In the absence of a completed rail line, stagecoaches bridged the gap between Caliente and the closest railhead in San Fernando. But due to the tenacity of SP's engineers, this was only a temporary setback. In 1876, a large horseshoe curve was cast around the east side of Caliente, and crews began blasting away at the mountains, looping the tracks continuously to gain as much elevation and as short a distance as possible. The 2.52% grade that Tehachapi is infamous for starts here, and barely relents until the top of the pass at Summit Switch. Trains gain almost 500 feet in elevation between here and Bealeville, where the next train order office was located. With the end of SP's terminus, Caliente's temporary population moved on, and today little evidence of the land boom Colton facilitated remains. About the only things you can find moving in the valley apart from cattle are trains, but even that isn't a given. That's because Caliente, like Bina, is a popular place for train meets. Sitting at the end of Double Track is a manifest freight led by UP8005, a 2012-built General Electric ES44AC. 
Introduced in 2005 as an evolution of GE's hyper-successful AC4400 series, the ES44 uses a 12-cylinder GEVO prime mover to produce 4400 horsepower while adhering to EPA Tier 3 emission standards. UP has over 1500 GEVO powered units on its roster, making them easily the most common locomotives on UP trains in Tehachapi. Since their introduction, GE's six-axle units have always found a home on Tehachapi, from U-boats in the 1970s to Dash 9 and GEVO locomotives of today. Fittingly, the northbound 8005 is waiting for is also led by a GE locomotive. UP6725 is a former Chicago Northwestern AC4400 CW, built for coal service in the late 1990s. With the acquisition of the Southern Pacific and CNNW, Union Pacific's fleet of AC44s drastically swelled. Recently, Wabtec Corporation, which purchased General Electric's locomotive business, has been remanufacturing much of UP's fleet as AC44CMs. But in this December 2020 view, these venerable CNNW warriors are still unrebuilt. From the valley floor in Caliente, the Mojave subdivision at Cliff can be seen clearly snaking its way around the upper reaches of Tehachapi Creek Canyon. The sheer walls and steep grades of the canyon south of here were the main impediment to progression for railroad construction crews, as by the time the tracks reached Caliente, their ability to follow Tehachapi Creek and gain sufficient elevation to reach the summit had been eliminated. The severe grade the canyon follows is illustrated by the fact that, by the time the creek reaches Rowan, it has in essence attained the same elevation as the tracks despite starting out over 500 feet lower at this point. Thus, the necessity of looping the tracks back to the west, which was always regarded as a temporary solution, was a compromise to regain the distance lost by Colton's Folly. To that end, Caliente was intended to be bypassed by the railroad within five to six years of the alignment's construction. However, budgetary constraints kept the original line in place, and the railroad invested the resources that they could into supporting operational needs at this site. As such, helper crews were based out of here for several years, and three water tanks for filling steam locomotives were built next to the station. In addition, a Y-track was laid on the east leg of the horseshoe curve to turn helper locomotives. But within a decade of building it, both Santa Fe and Southern Pacific moved their helper crews to Bakersfield. With longer and heavier trains operating on the pass, the grade from Bakersfield to Seaver began necessitating helpers for southbound trains to keep up schedules. So, the helper terminal was moved back to Bakersfield, and southbounds now passed through without the assistance of the Caliente helper. Even without the presence of a helper, Caliente remained a vital hub of operations on the west slope of the pass for quite some time. Trains still often needed to stop here to fill up on water before tackling the 2.52% grade. In the interest of speeding up train movements, an interlocking plant was installed in 1928 to allow the operator in Caliente Station to remotely control switches from their office. With the rear of their train to their right and below as they loop up the steep grade, southbound trains are in run 8 as they work up and out of the Caliente Creek Narrows. This particular southbound is another of UP's hot intermodals running along what's commonly referred to as the I-5 corridor. The trains are scheduled so that they can effectively compete with truck traffic on the interstate, and as such require utmost care in routing to minimize downtime. Indeed, the afternoon northbound out of LATC will often have trains along the entire pass sent into sidings well in advance so it can get into Bakersfield without stopping. Caliente's position at the confluence of both Tehachapi and Caliente Creeks has always made it particularly vulnerable to flooding. The 1983 floods were no exception, and the raging waters knocked out both bridges on the horseshoe curve for well over a month. With extreme drought conditions lasting through most of the 2010s, it may seem like the chances of another great flood like the one in 1983 are slim. But the 1983 flood was itself preceded by a five-year drought, and chances are that the railroad will once again face the prospects of rain-caused destruction. Tunnel 1 punches through a ridge separating Caliente from the Allard area. While the west portal is inaccessible without trespassing on private property, the east portal can be driven to and provides a fantastic angle for northbounds in the early morning. Bear Mountain forms an imposing backdrop for the Mojave subdivision between Caliente and Cliff. Confusingly, the 6,916-foot-tall mountain is one of 14 peaks named Bear Mountain in the state of California. As is the case across much of the Tehachapis, large swaths of the mountain's acreage are owned by a private ranch. Access on the pass is limited by the presence of such ranches, but they provide the benefit of maintaining Tehachapi's pastoral nature. The land around Tunnel 1 is owned by the McCarthy Ranch, and it isn't uncommon for visitors to see herds of cattle peacefully grazing while trains pass by. And it makes one wonder, do some of those cows take an affinity to watching passing trains? This is train U Pit Kai, a unit train of coiled steel cars heading to California Steel Industries Mill, located within the former Kaiser Steel Plant. BNSF routes this train over the former Santa Fe 2nd District to Fontana, where a local crew delivers the cars to the mill. While a large portion of the mill's property is now taken up by the Auto Club Super Speedway, the remaining parts of the mill still produce a large amount of steel products, many of them delivered by rail. Along this stretch of track, the north portal of Tunnel 5 can be seen some three rail miles away. 
In order to climb out of Caliente in as short a time as possible, SP construction crews had to use over 600 kegs of blasting powder per week to cut five tunnels into the hillside. Tunnel 2 is the shortest on this stretch of track at 232 feet, but it still attracts outsized attention from visiting rail fans. Often, multiple southbound trains will tackle the pass in quick succession. This is known as fleeting, and it allows the UP dispatcher to minimize the amount of dead time in between trains on the single track sections of the subdivision. If there's a southbound train approaching you here, there might be a second one not that far behind. Derailments are common on Tehachapi. The tight curvature of the route makes the possibility of stringlining an ever-present risk train crews must be aware of. Stringlining occurs when sections of lightweight, empty cars are subject to excess tension as they are pulled around a curve. The result? On tight curves like the one at Tunnel 2, strings of empty cars can fall on the inside of a track, resulting in the line being shut down and MOW crews needing to repair any damaged track as quickly as they can. Since when stringlining, cars mostly fall down cleanly, trucks and all, they can often be left in place like this for as long as months after a derailment, depending on if the plan is to repair or scrap them. Allard no longer exists as a station, though the location lives on in railfan circles to refer to the area around Tunnel 2. In 1962, SB extended the Allard siding to the north end of Bealeville, creating a section of double track two and a half miles in length. The long siding makes for another popular place for meets, as southbound trains will often be found holding the south end of the siding for a fleet of northbounds to pass before tackling the most remote part of the subdivision between Cliff and Rowan. On one particular night, there was an unexpected addition to the usual northbound parade. On August 22, 1952, a helper unit, Baldwin AS616 No. 5238, accidentally detached itself and its caboose from a train at Cliff and began drifting downgrade, picking up substantial momentum as it coasted through Bealeville. Without the ability to brake sufficiently, it slammed into the lead engine of a Santa Fe train parked at the east end of Allard's siding. While nobody was killed in this incident, it highlights the difficulties that operating trains at a 2.5% grade can pose. Capacity has always been an issue on the hill. During the years the SP was owned by E.H. Harriman, the railroad explored the possibility of electrifying the subdivision with third rail. Due to the additional projected costs, this wound up being rejected. A second, gentler line was proposed in 1912 that departed from the grade at Bina and looped its way through the mountains on the other side of Tehachapi Creek. Though easier for southbound tonnage, the line was prohibitively expensive, with 27 tunnels and 15 viaducts on the proposed grade. Ultimately, it would take intervention from the state of California to actively pursue double tracking. Originally, the segment from Caliente to Allard was one of several sections to have a second track installed, though only one segment linking Marcel and Waylong sightings has been completed as of 2023. To this day, the Mojave subdivision remains among the busiest single-tracked pieces of railroad in the world. Fires on Tehachapi are a frequent occurrence, though their disruptiveness to rail activities are usually minimal. This fire in particular was caused by a train, however, and the area immediately surrounding the UP tracks at Allard was charred by the blaze. A brake was sticking on a southbound UP train the previous night, and the resulting sparks had caused several small brush fires to start. Kern County Fire was called, and throughout the night they set a perimeter around the blaze to contain it. Twelve hours later and the fire is mostly out, and trains are allowed to pass through Allard again. Even this far removed from an active blaze, the charred landscape still smolders, and firefighters are acutely aware of the risk of a new fire starting that any spark flying from the smoking vegetation will bring. The red smudge on the hills in the background is Foscheck, an airdropped fire retardant that is dropped from aircraft to slow the spread of flames over a large area. The phosphate-based material has an additional benefit, as phosphates are vital nutrients for plants. On the ground, Kern County Fire uses a combination of four-wheel drive pickup trucks and ATVs to patrol the area and check for hotspots. Fire roads are another tool in the firefighter's kit to combat blazes like the one at Allard. Roads like these are used both for transport and for defensible space, as the lack of brush allows for a break between sections of combustible fuel. Kern County requires 30 feet of clear-cut defensible space and 100 feet of reduced brush around residences for the same reason. Another southbound charges upgrade through the fire zone. SD-70 ACE leaders are relatively uncommon on BNSF trains in California, though with the collapse of the Powder River coal traffic they are purchased for, they have become more dispersed around the system. 
Unlike UP's 83 through low 8600 series units, which are still allowed to lead on UP trains, older, non-isolated cab ACE units are prohibited from leading trains on BNSF due to excessive noise and vibration. Fittingly, crews nicknamed these units Thunder Cabs. The north side of Allard affords a great view of the twists and turns the tracks make along the hillsides here to help with easing the gradient to Bealeville. Added curvature helps to increase the distance trains must travel, but also reduces the severity of the grade, and appropriately, southbounds climbing up to Bealeville must negotiate a horseshoe curve here before arriving at the south end of the siding. With the results of the fire in the background, the view afforded by hiking back a mile from the Bealeville Road grade crossing is absolutely stunning. In addition to the cows scattered throughout the fields, large numbers of crows, vultures, and red-tailed hawks sail on updrafts created by the 100 degree temperatures of this August day. Windy conditions and heat are a deadly combination in wildfire-prone areas, and the fall fire season in California has continually expanded its scope as the state remains gripped in extreme drought. It almost makes one wish for the stormy conditions that resulted in the 1983 flood, though that incident proved that too much water can also be a headache for the railroad to deal with. Despite these conditions, Kern County has this fully contained. Using both air support from their station in Keene and on-the-ground units, the crews working this blaze have ensured that it won't hamper the flow of traffic any longer. Bealeville was named for Edward F. Beal, a local bureaucrat who owned the Tahone Ranch that used to surround the tracks at this location. In steam days, Bealeville hosted a station and telegraph office, but like most structures along the subdivision, it was torn down some years ago. Today, southbounds waiting to tackle the grade to Rowan are often found sitting just west of the Bealeville Road grade crossing. Bealeville is another location where the north portal of Tunnel 5 is viewable. Northbounds like this UP manifest to Roseville can be seen from Bealeville drifting down grade on the other side of Clear Creek Canyon. Bealeville's position as the most accessible section of track between Caliente and Rowan lends itself a particular importance to UP maintenance of way crews. In recent years, UP has turned the area around the grade crossing into a makeshift MOW yard, with work equipment almost always parked here waiting the call to action. Or, like this flatbed truck dropping off stick rail, returning from a day's work on the hill. As of filming in April of 2022, Tehachapi Pass was undergoing a rail replacement project, and on this particular afternoon the crew from Omaha Track, a contractor that specializes in recycling old rail equipment, was holding track and time at Rowan to remove some old rail. Once finished, the high rail vehicle moved down the main line to Bealeville, and the operator in the attached crane unit is now hard at work placing the rail in an existing pile adjacent to the siding. Regardless of the work order, traffic on the pass can move up to the edge of the affected area, and behind this southbound BNSF intermodal, five more trains are bunched up between here and Kern Junction. High rail vehicles work by attaching a set of flanged wheels to the frame of a car or truck, which allows the road-capable vehicle to utilize the main line and not tie up siding space once it's done for the day. While earlier maintenance crews may have used speeders or other rail-only vehicles, the utility of the high railer is that it can simply drive to a great crossing and leave the rail, adding an extraordinary amount of flexibility to MOW crews. This is one of the reasons why Bealeville has become so important to UP maintenance crews, as the road crossing provides a convenient place to get on and off the tracks. While Bealeville itself is located on relatively open ground, the ravine directly to the east of the station site required the boring of four tunnels in order to bring the right-of-way up and onto the ridge they would follow to Rowan. From Cliff, the tracks now follow Hood's original plan to loop alongside the mountains, and with one last push, trains can rid themselves of Colton's decision and return to a somewhat more forgiving alignment. Even if the curvature is gentler, however, the geology that the tunnels slice through can still be quite violent. Unbeknownst to SP when it built the line, the area between Bealeville and Cliff sits atop the White Wolf Fault, a strike-slip fault with a tendency for violent upheavals. At 3.52 a.m. on July 21st, 1952, an earthquake struck the fault with a magnitude of 7.5 on the Richter scale, causing widespread damage throughout Kern County. The water tanks at Tehachapi, Caliente, and Bina collapsed, numerous buildings in Tehachapi were leveled, and, most importantly, between Bealeville and Cliff, the SP line had been instantly severed. Tunnels 3, 4, 5, and 6 were all damaged by the tremor, and even as the aftershocks continued to roll in, it was apparent to SP crews that the line would be shut down for quite some time. Tunnel 3 south 200 feet would need to be daylighted, tunnels 4 and 6 were so severely wrecked they would need to be bypassed by the line rather than repaired, but the most significant and challenging problem facing SP crews was Tunnel 5. Tunnel 5 was the longest bore on Tehachapi and had been the most difficult one to build during the line's construction, and it had been ravaged by the quake. 
Significant portions of the lining had caved in, rail inside it had been thrashed so horribly that large segments were simply never found, and, most importantly, building a way around the tunnel would require filling in significant amounts of dirt on a sheer cliff above Clear Creek Ravine. Fortunately, construction contractor Morrison Knudsen was ready. Within 24 hours, they had already begun the process of filling in a temporary track, known as a shoe fly, around the hill Tunnel 5 was bored through. Working with over 100 bulldozers, the construction crews dug out the hillside on the west side of Tunnel 5, carving out the new alignment in as timely a manner as possible, and using the 250,000 cubic yards of dirt they excavated to build a new, 132-foot high fill over the ravine. Within 26 days, the shoe fly had been completed and traffic resumed, though at significant cost. $2.5 million needed to be spent in order for traffic to be restored, a cost of over $22 million in today's money. While the shoe fly remained in place for 65 years, heavy rains in 2017 caused it to collapse, and today, little evidence of the alignment remains. From a point just past daylight at Tunnel 6's south end, one can view trains working their way up and around the Caliente Horseshoe through Allard and Bealeville to Tunnel 5. Although the southbound one can view is never more than two miles away from the north end of cliff siding by air, by rail, the journey it's had to take was over seven miles in length. Impatience can grow for the visiting rail fan as the evening sun starts to fade, even more so if a surprise northbound is thrown into the mix. But this is part of what makes Tehachapi so magical. Even when all seems lost, the sun is about to set, and you're considering packing it up and just heading home, more often than not, it just all works out. When that southbound finally pops out of Tunnel 5 in a cloud of thick, black smoke, the wait was more than worth it. The scars of war make Tehachapi what it is. A century and a half of constant battle against nature itself have proven taxing for the railroads that operate on the hill. But even the threat of cataclysmic, instantaneous disaster won't stop the constant flood of trains that pound through Tunnel 5. From Cliff, the tracks plunge into the remotest part of the subdivision as they cling to the steep hillside above Tehachapi Creek, passing through Tunnel 7 and 8. 
At Rowan, the tracks become accessible again, and southbounds work their way around a horseshoe curb before passing underneath Highway 58. Woodford sits just below the world-famous loop at Waylong, and upon crossing to Hatchapi Creek twice, trains pass over themselves as they continue their climb to the summit. This section of track covers 10.4 miles, with a ruling grade of 2.5%. Track speed is 23 miles an hour, and the line is single-tracked with passing sidings. Upon exiting Tunnel 5 and passing through the daylighted remains of Tunnel 6, trains begin their journey to Rowan as they snake their way along the hillsides. The serpentine alignment afforded to the tracks here is due to the erosion of the mountains by seasonal rainfall, and the channels formed by water flow necessitated the construction of several fills where water was funneled during storms. No public roads exist between Tunnel 5 and the west end of Rowan, and the railroad access roads that do exist are steep and narrow, leading to difficulty in getting back to Tunnel 7 and 8 without a four-wheel drive vehicle. Due to the curvature and stiff grade, cliff siding has been the location of numerous stringline derailments over the last decade, and whenever a train derails here, it shuts down the pass for several hours, if not a full day. Between cliff's remoteness, inaccessibility, and the danger of derailment, this section of track is some of the most tricky to operate over the entire Mojave subdivision. Much of the wild terrain north of Tehachapi Creek at Cliff is now protected as part of the Frank and Joanne Randall Preserve. The 72,000-acre nature preserve is made up of lands purchased from private ranches by the Nature Conservatory to help establish a wildlife corridor from Canada to Mexico. The Tehachapi Mountains are critical in this corridor project, as they form a meeting place of four distinct ecosystems. The San Joaquin Valley, South Coast Mountains, Mojave Desert, and Sierra Nevada all blend together here, and such mixing often produces critical habitat for sensitive and migratory species. As such, the pass is home to a number of endangered fauna, including California condors, golden eagles, legless lizards, and mountain lions, and several endangered plants are also native here. During the spring, visiting rail fans can take in the native wildlife during lulls in train activity, and something is almost always moving in the trees. Turkey vultures are a common sight catching updrafts above the tracks, and on occasion, tarantula hawks, large wasps native to the region, can be seen loudly buzzing by. From Rowan, the overall character of the pass starts to be more forested, with live oaks crowding around the tracks from here to the western approaches of the Tehachapi Valley. Tehachapi Creek has risen up to the tracks here, and will closely follow the Mojave subdivision to the summit. The second alignment proposed by the SB in 1912 would have been clearly visible here on the other side of the canyon, though no construction ever took place. However, that doesn't mean that the Mojave subdivision will be the only rail line crossing Tehachapi Pass in the future. California High Speed Rail Authority selected Tehachapi Pass as their preferred route for their Bakersfield to Palmdale segment, and as of 2022, their proposed grade will generally follow the original William Hood alignment, bypassing Caliente Creek entirely to eventually cross over the Mojave subdivision at Rowan. From there, the line will occupy the opposite side of Tehachapi Creek Canyon all the way to Tehachapi itself, before turning south towards the Antelope Valley. Rowan Siding was originally constructed in 1885 as part of a capacity increase project to ease congestion. To this day, the siding remains among the most popular for meets on the pass. Trains whose crews have run out of hours, otherwise known as being dead on the law, are sometimes slotted into sidings onto Hatchaby while the crews await a van to take them to Bakersfield for their mandatory 8 hours rest. Some BNSF trains will run between Bakersfield and Needles with one crew, in order to save time that would otherwise be spent swapping crews at Barstow. These trains are known as long pool runs. While cost-efficient on paper, when mechanical failures or other delays happen, employees will have less hours to get to their terminal, resulting in clogged sightings and patch crews being sent to places like Rowan. An ex-Southern Pacific AC 4400 CW leads this northbound manifest at Rowan. The ACs were the last units delivered new to the SP before the railroad was purchased by UP, and fittingly were some of the last units on UP's roster to retain their SP paint. By 2022, only six of this model remain in their original scheme, with their remaining units scheduled to be repainted or rebuilt by Wabtec in the immediate future. With their disappearance, another reminder of the SP heritage of Tehachapi will be erased forever. Another formerly common sight on Tehachapi are these SD-70Ms. UP ordered over a thousand of these DC traction locomotives in the early 2000s, and they were the first engines on UP's roster since the 1950s to be delivered with the wings adjacent to the UP shield. Later models were also the first engines to be delivered with a large flag decal and their long hoods in commemoration of 9-11. With the introduction of a new paint scheme that has both of these elements removed and the shifting of SD-70s to local work, scenes like this will become increasingly rare in the future. The south end of Rowan Siding is the location of the second crossing of Tehachapi Creek. In 2006, the approaches to this bridge were completely replaced, reinforced against future flooding. The last unit on this Coast Starlight Detour is a depowered F40PH, converted to what Amtrak refers to as an MPCU. Colloquially referred to as cabbages due to their combined purpose as cab and baggage cars, this unit is destined for Amtrak's Cascade service between Eugene, Oregon, and Vancouver, British Columbia. 
Also of note in this 2013 view is a former Santa Fe high-level lounge car, built in 1956 and converted in the 1990s for use as a Pacific parlor car. Before their retirement in 2018, the cars were a fixture on the Starlight and famously included amenities like snacks, wine tasting, and a library. Two private cars, the former Burlington Dome Car Silver Splendor and former Canadian National Observation Car Number 23, now named Tioga Pass, make up the rear of the train. Like Caliente Creek, Tehachapi Creek is prone to calamitous overflow, and the floods of 1983 were only the latest in a series of disasters to hit the pass. In 1932, record rainfall hit the Tehachapis and soaked the mountains, causing excessive runoff that quickly made Tehachapi Creek swell beyond its banks. On September 30th, a storm system parked over Woodford and began raining heavily, causing the already swollen creek to rise even higher. At Woodford, a pair of trains, one from SP and one from Santa Fe, sat beside each other in the siding. The Santa Fe train, sitting closest to the creek, had been abandoned by its crew, who had escaped to higher ground to avoid the floodwaters. As the rain poured down on the roof of the engine, a pair of SP signal maintainers sheltering inside felt the engine sway as the ground softened below the tracks. Escaping to safety themselves, the ground gave way and the 2102 tumbled into a ravine carved out by the raging waters below. The water continued to fall and began accumulating behind an artificial dam made up of debris swept downstream by the flooding. The SP train, stationed at the other end of the siding, was itself waiting for the worst of the storm to pass when the dam suddenly burst. A tidal wave of muddy water crashed down over the locomotive and its train in a matter of seconds, miraculously sparing the life of its firemen, who clung to the smokestack for safety. As the water swept down into Keene, they smashed into a service station, obliterating the building entirely. As the rain slowed and then stopped, and the waters receded, the area around Woodford was left looking like a war zone. For the next few weeks, bodies continued to be recovered along Tehachapi Creek, with a number of the casualties being migrant workers escaping the Dust Bowl in Oklahoma and Texas. A total of 32 people lost their lives in the disaster, and it took some time to repair the line in full. Every crossing of Tehachapi Creek had been wiped out, and the total property damage was estimated to be $5 million, roughly equivalent to $108 million in today's money. The body of a crew member was found over a week later, washed all the way downstream to Ilmen, and it took well over a month to find the Santa Fe engine, which had been so thoroughly buried that it had to be located using Bakersfield High School's electromagnet. To this day, the bell and headlight of the locomotive remain lost, permanently claimed by the 1932 flood. Rowan was another location slated for double tracking as part of the Caltrans-funded Capacity Increase Project, but concerns from the Cesar E. Chavez National Monument in Keene about potential environmental impacts forced the state's hand to scale back the project substantially. The center, declared a monument by President Barack Obama in 2012, is principally located in the Nuestra Señora Reina de La Paz, or just La Paz, a complex of buildings that was built on the site of a tuberculosis sanatorium that had closed in the 1930s. Chavez was a labor leader in California who led the United Farm Workers Movement to organize predominantly Hispanic farm laborers into a union in the 1960s and 70s, and La Paz served as a headquarters for his campaign. Today, the center features exhibits detailing UFW's history and the legacy that Chavez has in California. UFW's headquarters are still located here, and Chavez is buried on the property in memory of his efforts to improve working conditions for farm workers across the country. The address for the center, however, doesn't read as Rowan or Woodford. That's because the area has kept its original name, Keene. Southern Pacific changed the name of the station to Woodford to avoid dispatchers confusing it with the similarly named Kern Junction. Kern County Fire Station 11 is also located in Keene. Tehachapi's proximity to several fire-prone areas in the Sierra Nevada necessitates the location of a fire brigade here, and the ability of Cal Fire and county agencies to fight wildfires often hinges on aircraft dropping water onto hotspots from above. N408KC is one such unit, a Bell UH-1H Iroquois built in 1967 for the U.S. Army. When the crews aren't out flying reconnaissance or maintaining fire roads, they can be found hiking in the mountains above Rowan and Woodford. Whether to familiarize themselves with the area or simply get out of the office for an afternoon is something only they know. A city rail leash unit leads a bare table train at Woodford. This train of all-purpose spine cars is delivering empty trailer chassis to BNSF's intermodal facility in San Bernardino, California. Such repositioning moves allow BNSF to efficiently shuttle company equipment from terminal to terminal without waiting for a full train of containers to be loaded onto the chassis, allowing for lower dwell times at facilities. Amtrak's Coast Starlight charges upgrade at Woodford. Engine 505 is a Dash 832 BWH, a non-streamlined Genesis diesel that was a common sight on these trains during the 2010s. With the introduction of hundreds of new Siemens ALC42 chargers to Amtrak's fleet, it's unlikely that GE engines like this will lead Amtrak detours through Tehachapi ever again. 
In the later years of steam, the water tanks at Woodford were the principal stops for water on the north slope of Dadgeby Pass, and were mandatory for all southbound trains working their way upgrade. While taking on water typically lasted somewhere between an hour and an hour and a half, the process could be accomplished in as little as 14 minutes, and it was a matter of pride for crews to see how fast they could complete their tasks. While today's diesels no longer need the tank's water, they still sometimes stop here to wait for opposing traffic to clear. Two AC4400 CWs run light. These units are on their way to the siding at Sanborn, outside of Mojave, where they will attach to the rear of a northbound grain train heading to the large Pittman Family Farms feed elevator at Guernsey, California. Most BNSF manned helpers are outfitted with a system called HelperLink, which acts as a remote uncoupler to allow helpers to detach from trains on the fly. This system allows for one-man crews and speeds up the time spent on attaching and removing locomotives, though units sourced from outside of dedicated helper pools tend to not be equipped with it. Look out for a small box attached to the front handrails of engines the next time you see manned helpers on Tehachapi, and you may spot a helper-linked equipped engine. Originally, Woodford had two through sidings that were used for train meets and water stops, but SP ripped out the north switch to the siding in the 1980s and began using it as a maintenance of waste spur, a practice UP continues today. Typical of the MOW equipment stored here is this train full of continuously welded rail, or CWR. In contrast to the bolted rail that made up most lines from rail's introduction as a transportation medium, welded rail is just that, sections of rail thermite welded together as opposed to bolted. The rail is easier to maintain, is stronger, and can be traveled at over high speeds more safely, making it the gold standard on most railroads across the world today. But in contrast to transporting small segments of rail which can be done quite easily in a flat car, CWR poses a challenge for transportation, and these trains are an elegant solution to that problem. Long segments of welded rail are strung through gates on each flat car, which helps stack the rail and keep it stable along its journey. Feeder mechanisms at the end of the train allow the rail to be placed at either side of the track, allowing for speedy rail replacement without too much time spent closing the line. Rail like this needs to be replaced on a regular basis, but the advantages of CWR are clear when considering that replacing segments thousands of feet at a time are significantly faster than replacing them every 50 feet or so. Sitting at the front of the train is a unit painted in the new Union Pacific paint scheme mentioned earlier. UP 5279 is one of the first series of Jeevo locomotives on UP's roster, and was built in March of 2006. In 2022, its aging paint was given a refresh in UP's new corporate image, with the wings on the nose and flag on the side replaced by a UP shield and lettering, respectively. As of recording in December of 2022, there isn't any consistency with how UP has been painting these units at its North Little Rock, Arkansas shops, but the new scheme, and especially the large shield, is certainly eye-catching. From Woodford, the Tehachapi Loop can be seen clearly, and trains working their way downgrade show just how much elevation change the loop and the tight curves around it allow the Mojave subdivision. Without it, the grade would be much steeper, as the canyon floor rises too fast to maintain an easy gradient. The south end of Woodford is located at milepost 349.7. Mileposts on former SP lines are measured as to their distance from the road's headquarters in San Francisco, and thus increase in number as they head away from the Bay Area. To that end, this UP train would be considered heading eastbound by the SP timetable, while trains heading north on Tehachapi would be considered westbound. With the UP merger, this practice was discontinued, and north and southbound is the most relevant way to refer to trains operating on the pass today. Sitting in the siding at Woodford is another southbound, a Willow Springs, Illinois-bound intermodal train led by BNSF 3775, a 4400 horsepower ET44C4. An evolution of the ES44AC we saw at Caliente, the type has been in production since 2015. The T in the locomotive's designation refers to the unit meeting strict EPA Tier 4 emission standards, which requires a 90% reduction in particulate matter emissions and an 80% reduction in nitrogen oxide emissions compared to previous engines. The ET44 accomplishes this by using an exhaust gas recirculation system to heavily reduce emissions without the use of urea after treatment. Such systems necessitate significant heat dissipation, and the ET44's large radiators help to offset the heat generated by the EGR process. An unusual occurrence is a manifest train running around a hot intermodal, but the crew on this Fresno to West Colton manifest is short on hours and has additional switching to do outside of Mojave, necessitating the pass. The fourth crossing of Tehachapi Creek lies immediately to the south of Woodford Siding, and the tracks pass over the creek on this impressive deck plate girder bridge. Snow on Tehachapi rarely comes down to the Woodford area, but the mountains above the canyon are sufficiently high as to accumulate a dusting of it when the upper reaches of the pass are covered in an inch or two of snow. The fifth and sixth units in this consist are three GS21B locomotives, low-emission gensets built by National Rail Equipment in Paducah, Kentucky. 
Genset engines use multiple small diesel engines, in this case Cummins QSK-19s, to reduce emissions and improve flexibility, as engines can be turned off when not needed or taken out of service without impacting a locomotive's availability. However, gensets were notoriously unreliable throughout their careers on the big class ones, and most have been taken out of service and sold. An Amtrak inspection special drifts downgrade over the fourth crossing. P42DC156 has taken this train from Los Angeles and will recrew in Bakersfield before heading up the valley to Modesto. Traveling on the train is now former Amtrak CEO Joe Borkman. The inspection car bringing up the rear of the train, Amtrak 10001, the Beach Grove, was built as a standard and fleet coach in 1976 and was rebuilt for inspection duty in 1984. From the fourth crossing, trains begin their assault on the grade leading up to the loop. All throughout this section of track, the loop looms in the distance, providing a stark reminder of the challenge that lies ahead for crews working up grade. In the creek bed, the abutments of the old bridge can still be found, the last remnants of the original crossing that was wiped out during the 1932 flood. From here, the tracks twist around another horseshoe curve to gain as much elevation over Tehachapi Creek as they can. East of here, the canyon rises too rapidly to maintain the 2.2% grade hood envisioned on this section of track, thus the loop provided a convenient way to gain elevation in such a compact space. Another southbound crosses over the fourth crossing. BNSF 7678 is one of the last units delivered in the so-called Heritage 2 scheme, which mixes the colors of the Great Northern Railroad with the war bonnet of the Santa Fe. The scheme was replaced with the current swoosh logo in 2005. Descending the grade from Marcel, northbound trains pop through Tunnel 10 as they begin their trip around the loop. Trains of 0.7 miles or more in length will pass under themselves as they pass through Waylong, named for SB District Roadmaster W.A. Long. The fifth crossing of Tehachapi Creek is a unique, curved bridge necessitated by the tight confines of the canyon below the loop. Much of the land immediately surrounding the loop was originally owned by John Broom, who Broom Ranch is named after. Purchased in 1951, the 28,354-acre property surrounds the loop and pastured to the north of Highway 58, providing a critical stretch of undeveloped land for wildlife to move through that wasn't affected by a development boom in the 1970s. For this exact reason, the land had long been eyed by the Nature Conservatory, and was finally purchased in 2021 to help complete the wildlife corridor from Canada to Baja, California. It's unclear as to how this change will affect visiting rail fans. Access to the Loop Ranch has been limited since 2009, and photographers are encouraged to go off-property to the observation deck, leaving many trackside views impossible to get without the use of a drone or helicopter. UP3000 is an SD70HT4, a former EMD demonstrator unit. The T4 is EMD's equivalent to the GE Tier 4 we saw earlier, but unlike the GE unit, only two roads, CSX and Union Pacific, have purchased the model. With the introduction of battery-powered and hydrogen fuel cell locomotives in the near future, and massive rebuilding programs being undertaken of existing rolling stock, the future of Tier 4 locomotives generally is in doubt, and the 100 purchased by UP may be the largest fleet of this model ever bought. For now, the most accessible trackside location to capture images of the loop is located immediately to the west of Tunnel 9. Here, southbounds can be seen charging upgrade from the side of Woodford to Hatchaby Road as they plunge into the tunnel, only to cross over themselves. For a more broad view, however, the Tehachapi Depot Museum has recently completed work on a brand new viewing deck that offers stunning views of the loop as a whole. From this elevation, trains can easily be seen working their way upgrade from the 5th crossing to Tunnel 9, such as the Stockton, California to Willow Springs intermodal train with NS1071, the Central and New Jersey Heritage Unit, second out. The Z Stowisp can be identified by the large number of refrigerated boxcars scattered throughout the train, carrying Central Valley produce to eastern markets. The Tehachapi Loop is one of five locations on the pass with live stream cameras that document passing trains. Combined with the cameras at Edison, Cable, the Tehachapi Depot, and Mojave, they provide visiting rail fans with unparalleled foreknowledge of train movements, and their effect is furthered by the use of ATCS monitor and radio scanners. For the more laid-back rail fan, Tehachapi Loop is itself a fantastic place to sit back and watch the trains go by, as the Overlook provides an unparalleled view of the action that happens here every hour of every day. There's no other place on Earth with this level of accessibility that so eloquently displays the drama of mountain railroading, and the trains that work their way around the Loop are all traveling on hollowed, sacred ground.
south of the loop, trains continue their climb up the Tehachapi Creek Canyon. The canyon narrows considerably after Marcel, and the tracks must travel through four tunnels to reach more open ground. At Cable, double track begins and will continue all the way to Mojave, and southbounds pass through the cable crossovers before reaching Tehachapi proper. 2.1 miles up the line is Summit Switch, where southbounds finally conquer the Tehachapis and begin their descent into Monolith, home to a large cement plant. This section of track covers 12.8 miles, with a ruling southbound grade of 2.5%. Track speed is 23 miles an hour to Tehachapi and 60 to Monolith, and the line is double tracked after Cable. The only successful implementation of the Caltrans Capacity Increase project was between Waylong and the north end of Marcel Siding. Tunnel 9 had previously stifled efforts to double track this section of railroad, so starting in 2014, a large cut was made to the north side of the tunnel to allow a second track to be put into place. Two years later, the tunnel has been bypassed and the double tracking project has been completed. The double track is used as an extra long siding to speed up northbound trains downgrade trip, and northbounds will often be found stopped here waiting for southbounds to work their way around the loop. This isn't the only tunnel that was bypassed on this section of track, though. Originally, three more tunnels existed between here and Tunnel 14, with Tunnels 12 and 13 being daylighted in the 1920s, and Tunnel 11 being daylighted in the 1940s. Marcel is also a common location for derailments on Tehachapi, though its ease of access compared to Cliff reduces the time that the subdivision is shut down. Careful planning on behalf of Yardmasters is necessary to reduce the risk of stringline derailments, but even with the best of plans, trains wind up derailing every three months or so. Woodford to Hatchapi Road follows the tracks here and allows for spectacular views of the Mojave subdivision. Several pull-offs enable railfans chasing southbound trains to get repeated shots as trains work their way up the Tehachapi Canyon Narrows. Leading a southbound Autorack train at Marcel is GP7964, the 5,000th production Jeevo locomotive. Since this footage was shot in March of 2013, its commemorative decals have been removed, leaving little evidence of its significance. Woodford to Hatchapi Road gains considerable elevation east of Marcel, and the height difference allows for sweeping views of the Mojave subdivision as it curves its way up grade. On clear days, the county dump at the hills above Sanka can be seen from this location, which gives perspective as to the extra distance the curvature of the rail alignment makes. While only 18 miles away by air, Sandcut is 30 miles distant by rail. A work train heads up to Summit Switch behind a lone ES44AC after dropping off some rail at the Gray Crossing at Bealeville. This area was the site of Tunnel 13, and is now the section of track that holds the steepest grade on the subdivision. For 1,000 feet, the gradient profile increases to 3%, but its short length does not affect train speed as trains are already in run 8 or full dynamics when passing by it. The remaining set of four tunnels that were dug between Marcel and Cable were necessitated by the tight confines of Tehachapi Creek Canyon. If the railroad wants to double track this section of track, new tunnels will need to be bored to help the tracks bypass the sheer cliffs on this section of railroad. The cloud of dust coming from the Tier 4 GE on the rear of this manifest is sand, which is used to bolster a train's adhesion to the rails when working upgrade and prevent wheel slippage. Another kind of steam era infrastructure that long went the way of the code line were telltales. In the days before air brakes and dynamic brakes, when brakemen would ride the top of cars to set individual brakes in order to slow the descent of trains down the hill, telltales, wood frames with ropes hanging from them, would be used to alert crew members to duck before the portal of a tunnel. With the advent of dynamic brake-equipped diesels on the hill in the 1950s, the need for telltales disappeared, though many remained on the hill into the 1960s, guarding the entrances to tunnels. In fact, one existed at Tunnel 5 until the late 1980s. Originally, the tunnels onto Hatchapi were lined with timber, but were upgraded to concrete in the early 1920s to increase their longevity in the harsh mountain conditions. This was a double-edged sword, though, as the concrete was significantly more difficult to modify once it was set compared to wood. When the project to accommodate high cube double stacks in the 1990s commenced then, most of the tunnels on the subdivision had notches cut into their bores, which increased the clearances to allow for larger containers. SP signed off on this upgrade with a stipulation that it would not run double stacks over to Hatchapi, and chose to route its stack traffic on the parallel coastline. But when SP was purchased by UP, its successor began running double stacks across the subdivision. BNSF sued to block UP from routing its traffic over to Hatchapi, but a court ruled that since the agreement had been with SP and not UP, UP was legally able to continue running double stacks over the line. Another crossing of Tehachapi Creek marks the north end of Cable. Here, the canyon broadens sufficiently for double track to return, and the dispatcher will often hold northbounds here to wait for fleets of southbounds to tackle the summit. The second unit on this train is a former Burlington Northern SD-70 Mac, painted in the pre-merger executive paint scheme. The development boom in the 1970s mentioned earlier was most significant in the area between Marcel and Cable, where large numbers of homes were built in the hillsides above Tehachapi Creek Canyon. The roads here allow visiting rail fans to pull off and take in the sweeping vistas afforded by the steep mountains. 
BNSF occasionally runs light engine moves over the hill between Bakersfield and Barstow to balance out power at terminals. Like the bare table train we saw at Rowan, these moves allow BNSF to most efficiently use their available equipment. BNSF's grain trains are about the heaviest train seen on Tehachapi nowadays, but in times past other unit trains of equal weight thundered across the pass. From the 1980s until 1995, Tehachapi Pass was home to some of the heaviest regularly scheduled freight trains on the SP system. The loaded crude oil trains, which ran for Royal Dutch Shell Company between Seiko, north of Bakersfield, and Carson, were a fixture on the hill, usually running loaded in the afternoon with multiple sets of manned helpers aiming and lugging the train up the stiff grade. The tank train cars that made up the oil cans were relatively rare, and were specially designed to be continuously connected via hoses. This combination of heavy weight and specialized equipment made the train extremely popular with rail fans, as not since the oil boom of the early 1900s had so much crude oil passed over to Hatchapi. However, Shell recognized that Tehachapi was an operational headache for its trains and built a new loading facility south of Mojave. The last oil can passed through Tehachapi on October 31st, 1995, closing an iconic era of operations on the pass. In more recent years, the oil can sets were migrated to the parallel coastline, where they ran between one post, north of Paso Robles, to Carson. On December 29, 2018, they ran for the last time, and since then the Golden Hills of Southern California have been devoid of the iconic tank train consists. The tracks in Highway 58 are now both on the same side of Tehachapi Creek, and this proximity allows for several pull-offs that work their way down to the tracks. Due to the orientation of the mainline, southbounds are in good light all throughout the year at Cable, and train chases from the loop or Woodford will often end here. One of the trains moving southbound at Cable is an LATC-bound intermodal behind UP2768. Despite sharing a number series as the Tier 4 Jeeva is behind it, 2768 is not a Tier 4 unit. The engine was delivered as a credit unit, a standard Jeevo that was made alongside a Tier 4 order. For every Tier 4 unit purchased, EPA rules allow railroads to purchase a Tier 3 unit to match. However, Wabtec cannot build more Tier 4 credit units than the number of actual Tier 4 units they produce, making traditional Jeevos virtually impossible to purchase as long as railroads continue to not buy large quantities of Tier 4 units. UP often tests new power and dedicated service between Roseville and West Colton. In the early 2000s, sets of 6,000 horsepower SD90 Max would be used on manifest traffic through the pass, though the unreliable nature of their 265H engine meant that the high horsepower units lasted only a few years before retirement. Between the late 2000s and mid-2010s, a pool of 53 and 5400 series units were based out of Roseville and were the primary power for manifest trains on Tehachapi. The pent-up exhaust in the tunnels on the route gave the engines a particularly dirty look. Railfans coined the phrase California Jeevos to refer to the engines, but these themselves were displaced by new ET44 AHs in 2016. This dedicated service only lasted a year before the Tier 4 Jeevos were dispersed around the UP system, and today, power of all varieties can be found hauling Roseville-bound traffic onto Hatchby. A crossover is located at milepost 358 and allows the dispatcher to route trains from one main to another. Northbounds here can be passed around by higher priority trains, or ones with crews low on their hours looking to speed up their trip into Bakersfield. Foreign power is common on Tehachapi. Every Class 1 railroad in North America engages in horsepower hour repayment, which allows engines not from BNSF or UP to appear on the pass. Locomotives from one road will spend time hauling freight on other Class 1s in order to repay back the time said Class 1's power spent on the host railroad, which leads to ebbs and flows in the supply of foreign power. In times where BNSF power is common on CSX, for instance, BNSF is accumulating horsepower hours that CSX must repay by lending locomotives to BNSF. By contrast, run-through power is rare on Tehachapi, due to the relative lack of through trains that come from eastern or northern connections. Tehachapi was originally known as Tehichapa, and originated as a pair of post offices located at nearby Williamsburg and Greenwich, named for Peter Green, its founder. When the railroad bypassed both settlements on its arrival here in July of 1876, residents of both towns literally moved their houses to be closer to the station, and the original settlements were later incorporated into Tehachapi's city limits. Today, Tehachapi is a population of 12,000, and the spirit of the railroad is present throughout the community. Many civic decorations and businesses are decorated with locomotives, and plaques all throughout the downtown area detail the history of the railroad in the Tehachapi Valley. The current depot in Tehachapi was opened in 2010, after the 1904 built depot was burnt down in 2008. The station is the location of one of the rail cams along the subdivision, and visiting rail fans are welcome to enter into the museum during operating hours and check out their extensive collection of artifacts and exhibits. Outside, the depot also plays host to the varied signal collection of former SP supervisor and Tehachapi resident Bill Stoko. When Stoko passed away in 1999, some of his collection was sold to the city, who placed it outside of the museum. They now stand watch over the Mojave subdivision as a reminder of the huge variety of signals that have been in use on Tehachapi. 
The signals in front of the depot themselves were once a cantilever signal bridge, and while it no longer stands, looking at the signals here, it isn't hard to imagine a time when they did. While no passenger trains today traverse Tehachapi Pass, in 1945 the station at Tehachapi hosted 12 passenger trains each day. Southern Pacific operated the San Joaquin Daylight, a mail train, the Owl, and the West Coast in both directions, while Santa Fe ran the Grand Canyon and the Scout. After the cessation of passenger service in 1971, the station served as the signal maintainer's office until a new, dedicated structure was built across the tracks. Today, only Amtrak California through buses between Bakersfield and Los Angeles traverse the pass, picking up their passengers at the Tehachapi Park and Ride lot down the street. The loss of passenger service doesn't mean that the spirit of the railroad doesn't live on in Tehachapi. The area around the station is a mecca for visiting tourists and locals alike, and between the signals, seasonal decorations, and excellent sandwiches at Conan's County Bakery, downtown Tehachapi is a must-visit location for rail fans on the pass. A trio of Helperlink-equipped GE units glide through Tehachapi to cross over at Cable behind a southbound manifest. Usually, helpers will cut off at Summit Switch, but congestion on this morning has forced the dispatcher to slot the low-priority move behind several southbounds held up between here and Cable. After the helpers depart, the southbound UP manifest notches up its throttle for the last two miles to Summit Switch. Originally, a turntable for turning helpers was located here but has long since been removed. But even far into the diesel era, the spur was still referred to as the turntable track. In addition, a spur to service lime kilns in town was built in the late 1800s, and still exists to store bad-ordered cars and MOW equipment. A precursor to the cement industry that is found east of town today, in 1888, 12 kilns existed producing limestone for market in and around Tehachapi. Summit Switch marks another transition point in Tehachapi's ecosystem. The live oaks of the past below the town of Tehachapi have given way to wide-open brown scrubland. This is the Tehachapi Valley, a long trench extending from here to the beginning of Cache Creek Canyon at Eric. The alignment of the tracks is noticeably more gentle from here onwards, allowing trains to pick up speed as they begin the steep descent into the Mojave Desert. In times past, most Southern Pacific and Santa Fe trains would stop at the summit to cut off their manned helpers, but now only heavy BNSF trains that need an additional push set off their helpers here. The switch at Summit Switch refers to a siding which extends beyond the Highway 58 overpass, and is typically used to store maintenance of way equipment, though another switch allows UP local LOP51 to access the spur leading to Chemtool, a local chemical company. In earlier eras, an SD40-2 or SD60M would have been the preferred power out of Mojave for such jobs, but a trio of SD70Ms have more than enough traction for the short local between their 12,900 available horsepower. Chemtool is one of only two online customers between Edison and Mojave, so most of the switching that occurs in the pass itself is relegated to maintenance of way trains, moving equipment in and out of spurs at Woodford, Bealeville, and Caliente. Summit Switch is also the place where California High Speed Rail will cross back over the Mojave subdivision on a viaduct before punching through a ridge south of town to enter the Antelope Valley. The ease of alignment afforded by the wide open space of the valley will allow for fast running for high speed rail train sets, and one day over under shots of freight and passenger trains may be possible here. East of the Highway 58 overpass, the tracks approach the edge of Tehachapi city limits. From here until the tracks pass under Highway 58 again at milepost 367, trains race across the Tehachapi Valley in the shadow of the former Lehigh Cement Mine, which dominates the mountain range to the north. After a long, arduous journey up the west slope of the Tehachapi Mountains, southbound trains pass by the abandoned Y and begin the steep descent down the 2% grade into Mojave. The south end of Summit Switch is the location of another former helper pocket. Southern Pacific would often store sets of locomotives here to assist trains up the hill or provide dynamic braking down the grade into Mojave. And late into the SP era, sets of former Rio Grande SD50s were the most common dedicated helper power found on the hill. Today, UP preferentially uses distributed power for their trains onto Hatchapi, and the pocket has gone out of use. Daybreak finds a northbound intermodal train gliding to a stop at the summit. 
A train hit a vehicle into Hatchaby the night prior, and only one main line through town is open, meaning that the Stockton-bound train must wait for UP's morning Z-Train, a ZLCTM for Tacoma, Washington, to pass by. is the Martin Marietta cement plant, whose lights dominate the eastern Tehachapi Valley from dusk until dawn. A few minutes later, the Tacoma Z charges up the valley. This was the original highway detector that was placed by Southern Pacific at milepost 363.6. In 2015, the detector was moved half a mile southward, and the new model sat at milepost 364.2. Like its counterpart at Ilman, the detector was used to ensure that loads would be able to fit through the tunnels located further down the line. If a car didn't fit the clearances of the Mojave subdivision, it would be set out at Summit Switch. Constant problems with the detectors meant that by mid-2022, it was taken down, making the area around it little more than a wide spot along the right-of-way. This area was known as Sullivan before Los Angeles County selected it as the source for cement for the Los Angeles Aqueduct. Large amounts of cement were needed for the project, and the Tehachapi Mountains are blessed with major deposits of limestone, so given the area's at the time untapped resources and proximity to both the SP mainline and the planned route of the aqueduct, the decision to locate a cement plant and quarry here was an easy one. To supply labor for what became the Monolith Portland Cement Company, a company, town, and agency were built here. Appropriately, Sullivan was briefly retitled Aqueduct before being named to Monolith. Originally, the cement for the mine was sourced south of Monolith and was brought to the plant via a five and a quarter mile long narrow gauge railroad, but in 1912, the original mine was exhausted, and a new quarry was built on top of Cuttleback Ridge to the northwest of the facility. The railroad was relayed to this quarry on a 6% grade, and the right-of-way can still be seen from the tracks to this day. In 1915, with the aqueduct completed, the plant was closed and sold six years later to U.S. Potash Corporation, who sold it after a year to the Monolith Portland Cement Company. By 1929, the narrow gauge railway was completely dieselized, with a pair of Plymouth locomotives running hopper trains between the mine and plant. In 1936, an electric railway was added to service an underground quarry, but by the early 1970s, both railroads were showing their age and were set to be replaced. The electric operation was the first to go, being replaced by trucks in 1972, and the railway to the plant was replaced by a conveyor in 1973, The one more run was made for a local high school in February of that year. Some of the equipment was sold to Magic Mountain in 1975, who used it in their since-closed Grand Centennial excursion ride. 
To this day, Plymouth Locomotive No. 7 can still be found in the local scrapyard. If the visiting railfan wants to view intact equipment, the contemporary action at Monolith is sure to impress. UP local LOP53 regularly makes trips from Mojave up to the mine to drop off loaded coal cars and empty covered hoppers, and leave with hoppers loaded with cement. Coal is burned in cement plants at high temperatures to raise limestone and other raw inputs for cement to their clinkering temperature, which is then mixed with gypsum to produce cement powder. As such, the trackmobile at Monolith is kept busy pushing hoppers to the dumper to unload their low sulfur coal. Like the Plymouth engines that preceded it here, the trackmobile is a low horsepower engine that is primarily used for switching around the plant, but comes with the benefit of added flexibility due to its pneumatic wheels. Similar to the high rail vehicles we saw at Bealeville, the trackmobile can operate on rail or road, which grants it the ability to drive around the facility without relying on existing track. Built in LaGrange, Georgia, trackmobiles have largely displaced dedicated switch engines at many industries across the United States, and watching it in action, it isn't hard to see why. Currently, the coal delivered to the monolith cement plant is some of the only coal that travels across the Tehachapi Mountains, but in times past, many carloads of black diamonds have traveled over the Mojave subdivision. SP and Rio Grande often teamed up to forage unit coal trains for mines in Colorado and Utah to Long Beach, passing over Donner, Tehachapi, and Cajon Pass to do so. Such trains would rival the oil cans in their length and tonnage, and would require swing and rear end helpers in order to get them over the pass. Santa Fe, and more recently BNSF, ran loaded trains in the opposite direction to a coal-fired power plant in Wasco, California, though in 2012 the plant switched to gas and the coal train stopped running. Another LOP53 finishes switching out the monolith facility. While UP used to use a dedicated fleet of SD60Ms on their locals on the pass, row power of various kinds, such as GVOs, AC4400s, and SD70 Aces, are most often used on locals as of 2022. The train's cars are occupying the North Main, leading to the dispatcher running a southbound BNSF intermodal on the south track. CTC's increased flexibility allows for moves such as this. And the ability to route trains around slower or stop traffic in double-track territory ensures that the BNSF crew will be able to get into needles within their allotted 12 hours. After the Chicago-bound train passes by, LOP-53 departs from Mojave. Once clear of the plant, LOP-53 races to the entrance of Cache Creek Canyon as it passes under the Highway 58 overpass. It will be to Mojave within the hour, and its cars will be appended onto the next southbound manifest that is called to work at the yard there. When snow in Tehachapi falls down, the Tehachapi Valley usually sees the most of it, with coverage varying from a light dusting to two feet deep. While not as intensive as the snowpack of the Sierra Nevada to the north, the mountains still see about one to two snowstorms every year, and for the California railfan not used to railfanning in a winter wonderland, the area around Monolith is a truly magical place to be, especially at sunrise. Part of the issue that MOW crews had with the high-wide detector here had to do with its performance, or lack thereof, during snowfall. When snow fell, a signalman had to be stationed next to the detector 24 hours a day to be present when it inevitably malfunctioned. Aside from its inability to operate in freezing temperatures, the high-wide detector had a number of other problems and was considered redundant even in its new form, leading to the railroad choosing to scrap the structure in 2022. Even with the hills in the background covered in snow, Monolith appears only slightly different from its normal cement-caked look. The cement dust that covers the ground here has hardened so much after repeated rainfall and coatings that even the action of digging a hole here requires a jackhammer to break through the reinforced ground, and the code line wire that was strung through here was also completely coated in cement, certainly a novel insulating material. When the line was converted to CTC and radio-operated switches and signals, one can only imagine the amount of time it took to remove each code line pole. The big swing of the tracks to the south at Eric can be seen from Monolith and even all the way back from Tehachapi. Rail fans visiting the area can look towards this section of track from the truck stop at the Highway 58 overpass to easily get a leg up on northbound traffic, and upon seeing a train there can even sprint over to the south end of Summit Switch to get the train passing by. While trains can move at 60 miles an hour up the grade from Mojave, many slower trains like BNSF's grain trains average around 40, and this can lead to a nice chase up the valley to Tehachapi or Cable. Regardless if it's 100 degrees out or bitterly cold and snowy, the trains of the Tehachapi Valley make this area well worth the visit. Constant action in the shadow of the cement plant gives Monolith a distinct identity, and the trains that pass through here rock the cement-covered landscape with their work to make it up to the top of the grade.
From Monolith, trains enter Cash Creek Canyon on their descent into the Antelope Valley, passing through Eric, Cameron, and Warren. This section of track covers 9 miles, with a ruling grade of 2%. Track speed is 60 miles an hour, and the line is double-tracked. Eric was once the location of a Y used to turn helper locomotives out of Mojave. With the advent of bidirectional diesels and the moving of cutting off helpers to Summit Switch, Eric was forgotten, but the remains of the Y aren't the only artifacts to be found in the area. To the northwest of Eric lies Tomokani State Historic Park. Created in 1993, the park preserves the historic site of a Kawayusu settlement, nestled in the hills above Monolith. Tomokani means winter village in the Kawayusu language, and the site is home to pictographs and other artifacts left behind by the tribe. Public access is limited to guided trails due to the sensitive nature of the area, so visitors are required to sign up well in advance. If a look back into the past isn't your speed, the visiting rail fan only need to look up at the hills around Eric to see the future. The Tehachapi Wind Farm was the first of its kind in the state when it opened in the 1980s. The Tehachapi Valley and Cash Creek Canyon are home to severe winds that are ideal for the 3400 windmills that make up the wind farm. Combined, their output exceeds 710 megawatts, enough to power 350,000 homes. This wind farm isn't alone either. In 2019, Amazon announced that it was planning on building a 47 megawatt farm in the Tehachapi Valley. As long as available acreage exists and the wind keeps blowing, the area will continue to see a renewable energy boom. The Mojave subdivision passes under Highway 58 at the entrance to Cache Creek Canyon. The width of the canyon allows for an alignment that does not need any filling or tunnels, which gives the impression that this section of track is easier to operate for crews, but looks can be deceiving. While derailments are much more scarce on this side of the pass, the steep grade of the canyon means that the risk of runaways is always present for southbound trains. Cameron was named after George Washington Cameron, who operated a stagecoach station here in the 1860s and 70s. Cameron is the point where the tracks swing easterly for their final descent into Mojave. Cameron Road is the only at-grade crossing between Eric and Mojave, and is a popular place to catch trains throughout the day. Northbounds can be seen working hard upgrade through Cameron in the shadow of the windmills that populate this region. Most common in the newer developments are Vesta V90s, a 2000 kilowatt unit that features three 144 foot long blades. Many of the first generation windmills will be replaced with such units in the near future, rendering the hillsides a much more uniform look than their current kaleidoscope of models. Prior to 1972, all southbound SP traffic on Tehachapi finished their journey via the Saugus Line in Soledad Canyon, but capacity problems at Taylor Yard in Los Angeles made the road's increasing freight traffic more difficult to fit at a yard that could not grow any further. To solve this issue and also help eastbound freights bypass the congested Los Angeles Basin entirely, the road began construction on the 78-mile-long Palmdale Cutoff, which was opened to through traffic in 1967. The cutoff allowed for freights to be reclassified at the new West Colton Hump Yard, and with the closure of Taylor Yard in 1988, eliminated the need for SP to even own the Saugus Line entirely. Fittingly, the line was sold to Metrolink in 1992 after the Northridge earthquake. Today, only the Lathrop Intermodal Train and a rock train from Vulcan outside of Palmdale use the original alignment through Saugus. A BNSF maintenance of way train charges upgrade at Cameron. This is a Scorpion train, so called because of the foldable ramp located on the last car of the consist. The ramp allows for easy offloading of equipment without the use of cranes, increasing the flexibility of deployment to virtually anywhere with sufficient clearance. From 1960 until the 2010s, the double track between Cameron and Mojave were signaled with two separate systems. Track number one was set up for bidirectional running with CTC, while track two was governed by automatic block signals that were set up for northbound traffic only. The spring switch crossover here allowed for faster northbounds out of Mojave to run around slower ones. As of 2022, however, both tracks have been converted to CTC, eliminating the need for the spring switch crossover. Originally, a second crossover was meant to be located here, but was never installed. Cameron is also the location where the famous Pacific Crest Trail crosses the Mojave subdivision. The 2,653-mile trail is maintained by the Pacific Crest Trail Association and provides hikers with an unparalleled trip from the Mexican border near Campo to the Canadian border near Manning Park. From late March until November, through hikers can be seen here traversing Cache Creek Canyon on their way to Kennedy Meadows in the long climb through the Sierra Nevada, and hikers will often overnight, or zero, into Hatchapi to take a much-needed break between weeks spent out on the trail. Cameron is mile 566.5 on the trail, and a water cache is located here. Gallon jugs of water are stored for hikers to utilize on their trip north, as no reliable water source exists between here and Golden Oak Springs, 16 miles up the trail. Cache Creek Canyon was another location surveyed for a potential, gentler alignment by the SP. 
The new line would have run on the north side of the canyon, and featured a main line several miles longer than the current route to alleviate the stiff grade faced by northbounds on this section of track. But like the proposed new track on the north slope, nothing came of this, and the original grade was double-tracked instead. Access to the tracks is somewhat limited between Cameron and Warren. Visiting rail fans must double back at Cameron Road to pull off along Highway 58 to catch northbound trains, making chasing northbound somewhat difficult. The effort is worth it though, as the canyon offers spectacular views of trains passing through it. Warren was the last station stop before Mojave. Trains heading downgrade from Summit Switch are in heavy dynamics, as they exit Cache Creek Canyon and enter the Antelope Valley. Dynamic braking works by reversing the traction motors on locomotives so that the motors act as generators, which increases resistance on the wheels and slows down the train substantially. This is significantly more efficient than simply using air brakes, and even more so than the method of crew members setting individual brakes on cars mentioned earlier. From here, the town of Mojave can be seen some six rail miles away. From this perspective, BNSF trains heading to and from Barstow, as well as UP trains heading to Cyril's on the Lone Pine Branch, can be seen leaving town and passing by the Mojave Air and Spaceport. A number of private planes fly in and out of the airport on a regular basis, and a huge variety of planes can be seen parked and flying around town. Between old military jets and modern business planes, for the plane enthusiast railfan, the port provides much entertainment while waiting for trains here. Due to the severe drop-off of Cache Creek, the massive S-curve here is necessary to stretch out the tracks and reduce the grade to the entrance of the canyon. At ground level, it's difficult to see the curve in its entirety, so luckily, access roads for the many windmills in the area give great perspective on this landmark. In the distance is California City, which boasts the third largest land area of any city in California at 203 miles, but its population of 15,000 is less than impressive compared to its geographic size. An Alliance Texas-bound intermodal train passes through Warren. Alliance is located on the north side of Fort Worth, and is home to both a major BNSF intermodal yard and Waptec's main locomotive construction plant. The Norfolk Southern C40-9W leading this train will most likely be rebuilt there, and come out as an AC44C6M as NS rebuilds its entire Dash 9 fleet. The second unit is NS1073, the Penn Central Heritage Unit. Joshua trees are common on this side of the pass. Named by Mormon settlers for the biblical character Joshua, Joshua trees can live for hundreds of years and provide a great prop for visiting rail fans. Iconic to the Mojave Desert, their place as keystone species and the encroachment of development into their habitat makes them a species worth protecting. Like many desert plants, their flowers are quite ephemeral, and only come out for a few weeks before wilting away, making scenes like this a must-capture when in bloom. The trees on the left side of the frame denote the location of the former maintenance of way camp and station at Warren. With the streamlining and centralization of MOW crews on the past to focus on subdivision-wide maintenance as opposed to section gangs, the need for dedicated buildings to house maintenance of way employees vanished, and the buildings here were demolished. The same ballast regulator we viewed working the main line near Edison is at work past the sweeping curve at Warren. Tehajabi was engaged in a maintenance blitz during this time period, and every afternoon the pass was shut down from 1 to 4 p.m. to accommodate the MOW crews. The priority of the LATC-bound intermodal passing through, though, meant that the line needed to be kept open for one more train, and then nothing else would move on the pass until the work crews were put away for the day. Located here are the remnants of the old road into Mojave. When a new bridge was built, the old alignment was abandoned, and the road now curves severely to get back to the old right-of-way. That begs the question, how many rail fans stood along this road to capture trains passing by this location? If they are filming here, chances are that they were shooting the iconic signal bridge that once guarded this location. Due to the north-south nature of the tracks here, it was lit all day, and many chases of southbound trains on the pass ended at this bridge. However, all good things must come to an end, and with the cutting over of signals from searchlights to the new trilights on November 17, 2014, the book was closed on the signal bridge, and all searchlight signals like it onto Hatchaby. Also at this location was the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power building, which was rail-served and had a spur off of the Mojave subdivision for taking in rail cars. In 2015, the building was demolished, and without the Signal Bridge and DWP building here, the view is considerably more plain. From here, much of the northern Antelope Valley can be viewed, and trains all the way out to Anzil and Sanborn on the UP and BNSF lines respectively are visible as they work their way into Mojave. The wide open spaces here affords rail fans the ability to plan for the chases of northbounds back into the pass, and the reliable mid-afternoon timing of the ZLCLT makes the northern edge of Mojave a great place to sit and plan for its arrival. By the same token, the consistent early morning run of the Brooklyn Z southwards at Mojave means that any trip up here will be blessed with the presence of a hot UP intermodal train. UP's 8000 series units were the first on the road to be delivered with the AH suffix instead of AC. The H in ES44AH stands for heavy, and the units are equipped with an extra 17,000 pounds of weight to increase tractive effort at low speeds. 
One of AC Traction's benefits over traditional direct current locomotives is lugging power at low speeds, and the extra ballasting helps the units move more tonnage without the assistance of another locomotive. Another U Pitkai train drifts downgrade into Mojave. The lead unit, BNSF 4423, was delivered in 1999 and is still on the roster as of 2022. With the retirement of large numbers of Dash 9 locomotives on BNSF's roster, the future of this unit and others like it is in jeopardy unless BNSF chooses to rebuild them. With their journey through Tehachapi Pass completed, trains ease their way downgraded to Mojave before taking off across the desert. But even though the journey through the mountains may be over for southbound crews, that doesn't mean that the canyon around Warren is devoid of heavy action. In fact, the area around Warren is stellar if the visiting rail fan is looking for great train-watching locations. Upon arrival in Mojave, BNSF trains depart the UP mainline and continue east through Sanborn and Bissell to Barstow, while UP's tracks head south to Anzal and Rosamont. UP's Lone Pine subdivision heads northeasterly for an interchange with the Turner Railway at Searles, while the Oak Creek Industrial Lead heads west to the Cal Portland cement plant at Oak Creek. This section of track covers 6 miles, with a ruling grade of 2%. Track speed is 25 miles per hour, and the mainline is double-tracked. Sunset outside of Mojave produces some incredible views, and this late November shot illustrates the intensity that low light, brand new locomotives, and desert scenery can bring to a scene. Sometimes the dispatcher will hold southbound trains outside of Mojave to allow for northbounds to enter the Mojave subdivision. This Richmond, California to Clovis, New Mexico auto rack train is led by BNSF 8185, a Tier 2 compliant ES44 C4. The C4 and ES44 C4 refers to the locomotive's A1A trucks, a feature pioneered by BNSF and GE. Unlike other six-axle diesels, the center axle of the ES44 C4 is unpowered, and actively shifts loads onto the powered axles at low speeds to improve traction and performance. This system has worked so well that BNSF has exclusively bought the unit since 2012, amassing over a thousand of them by 2022. The upper reaches of the Antelope Valley and the rear DPU of another southbound can be seen clearly from milepost 378.4. BNSF 7744, an ES44 DC in the lead engine of a manifest bound for Vancouver, Washington, turns off its ditch lights as to not blind the opposing crew. The second unit on the northbound train is a former Santa Fe SD75M, number 235. BNSF's SD75s were perennially in and out of storage in the 2010s, and in this 2014 view, the 235 only has a few years left on the BNSF roster before being sold to Progress Rail, who have since put the unit into storage at their facility in Mayfield, Kentucky. Mojave has always been a multimodal area, with air and space playing a significant role in the town's history alongside the railroads. Originally built to access mineral wealth in the area, Mojave Airport was opened in 1935. In 1941, the Marine Corps took over the airport as an auxiliary air station, and was used as a training base for pilots who would later fly from aircraft carriers. VMF-121 was one such squadron, which trained at Mojave in 1943 and later became the top-scoring Marine Corps fighter squadron of the war. In 1947, during a wave of decommissioning, the field was declared surplus and was leased to Kern County, which operates it to this day. Mojave was certified as a spaceport by the Federal Aviation Administration on June 17, 2004. The airport was the principal testing site for Virgin Galactic Spaceship 1 and 2, reusable low-orbital vehicles which carried out numerous tests in the area before becoming commercially deployed in 2021. 
In addition, nearby Edwards Air Force Base was often used as a landing strip for space shuttle flights until the retirement of the orbiters in 2011. Mojave is also the headquarters of Stratolaunch, an aerial launching platform for orbital rockets. Their main product, the Model 351 Stratolaunch Rock, was in essence two airline fuselages joined on a common wing, which were intended to hold a rocket between them and launch it into low orbit. But with the death of founder Paul Allen in 2018, the company ceased operations and put its assets for sale. The destruction of the AN-225 Mira during the opening phases of the Russo-Ukrainian War in 2022 meant that the Stratolaunch Rock is now the largest operational plane in the world, and Stratolaunch continues to offer high-speed testing solutions for aircraft manufacturers. But not all of Mojave's resident planes are active. One of the benefits of Mojave's 6.8 annual inches of rainfall is that metal tends to not rust very fast, rendering it an ideal location for the storage of surplus aircraft. Mojave's Boneyard thus serves a vital role for the aviation industry, by storing excess aircraft during downturns in traffic and retired aircraft that are in need of scrapping, and planes from all sorts of airlines can be seen from the railroad as they await either a trip back up into the sky or the scrapper's torch. The north end of Mojave is the junction point with UP's Lone Pine subdivision. Also known as the Jawbone Branch, the line was built in 1908 to help facilitate the construction of the Los Angeles Aqueduct, and was constructed to Oueno, where it met the roads Carson and Colorado narrow gauge subsidiary. In 1992, the branch was abandoned north of Cyril's, where SP interchanged with the Trona Railway. Today, almost all of the traffic on the branch is for the Trona, and the interchange at Cyril's receives both empty hopper trains to be reloaded with local product and unit coal trains from the Skyline Mine in Utah. Instead of traveling over to Hatchapi like they did in SP days, the coal trains head west from Salt Lake City, down the Los Angeles and Salt Lake route to Barstow, where they use trackage rights over the BNSF Mojave subdivision to reach Mojave. The property to the immediate west of the Mojave Air and Spaceport is used to offload windmill components for the many wind projects being built around here. Windmill towers are assembled in sections and are delivered to Mojave on specially modified 89-foot flat cars, which cradle the towers and ensure their stability while being transported. In addition to windmill-related work, several industries are located in the Pioneer Mojave Industrial Complex, which boasts an SW-type switcher to move cars around the facility. UP also switches out sulfuric acid tank cars at the Chimera Water Solutions facility, a few miles up the Lone Pine subdivision. Mojave's importance to the railroad is set to further increase within the next few years. In August of 2022, Kern County Board of Supervisors announced that a permit had been approved for the construction of an inland port at Mojave. Inland ports are transload facilities that take freight for motion going ships and transfers it to rail cars and trucks through the use of gantry cranes, which helps alleviate congestion at major ports by shifting some of their traffic away from the main hubs. The addition of capacity at Mojave will be necessary to keep ships cycling in and out of the Los Angeles area, and crews here will be kept busy switching out containers all day long. Perhaps the convenience and shorter distance of using the Saugus line for container transfers will cause UP to run more trains down the original SP alignment to Long Beach, but that's just speculation. Mojave Yard serves as a base for local crews working industries around the area. Until recently, a long-distance local, known as the Mojave Flyer, departed here daily to take local product down to West Colton Yard, but the train was abolished in favor of having road trains pick up carload freight here. But the end of the Mojave Flyer doesn't mean that all local activity ceased here. For instance, the crew of UP local LOP82 is to take a CSKTR coal train up the Lone Pine branch to Cyril's, but in order to do so, the train must be assembled first. As the loaded coal hoppers are sitting in the siding at Ansel, the assembled power behind a Tier 4 Jeevo, number 2638, must race southwards to couple onto the train and get it ready for departure. The UP crew must first use the power attached to the coal train to pick up the single covered hopper on the north side of the power consist, and attach it to the coal hoppers, and then drop off a unit on the south end of the train for use as a DPU. With two units already on the train at either end, the six GE engines in total should have no problem getting the heavy train up the grade to the summit at Cyril's. After dropping off the hopper, the engines run light to the south end of Ansel Siding. The Antelope Valley was so named because of the large number of antelope that used to roam freely through the area. Upon the arrival of European colonizers and the railroad, the herds were exterminated, and remained extinct locally until the 1980s, when a pilot program for reintroduction was started by the state of California.
Upon coupling, a crew member makes the necessary air brake and MU cable connections to enable the unit to be used as a DPU. MU cables are 27-wire jumper cables that transmit locomotive functions from one engine to another. Functions like the throttle, headlights, dynamic brakes, and others are all transmitted through these, making them vital for consists with more than one engine. After the 7403 has been set up, the remaining three engines head back to the north end of Ansel Siding. The reporting marks on the hoppers are DGHX, indicating their ownership by Searles Valley Minerals, the firm that runs the plant at Searles Valley. While the crew finishes preparations, a manifest passes by on the main line. This is the same train we viewed passing around a stop BNSF train at Woodford Siding. It had been switching an industry south of Mojave and now begins its trip across the desert to Cajon Pass and ultimately West Colton Yard. After the required air test, the train departs Mojave for Cyril's, curving onto the Lone Pine subdivision at milepost 380. The switch onto the branch is a manual switch not controlled by the UP dispatcher. The crew in the rented van must manually throw it back to the main line after the coal train's DPU clears the interlocking. After a long climb out of the Antelope Valley, northbound coal trains punch through Tunnel 29 and the ridge at the south end of Cyril's and begin to throttle down, as they bring their train into the interchange yard with the Toronto Railway. UP runs a local three times a week for Mojave to interchange empty phosphate cars, and the Toronto runs daily, making Cyril's quite the busy outpost in the desert. Back on the Mojave subdivision, the relatively flat terrain allows for fast running south of Mojave. Trains, like this ILCLT, make track speed as they race towards Tehachapi Pass. A southbound off of the Trona heads towards Rosamond. This is as far south as we'll venture on the UP, so let's return to Mojave to conclude with operations on the BNSF. Prior to the late 1980s, Santa Fe crews coming off the line to Barstow would have stopped at the Mojave Depot to pick up train orders for their run over the pass. The depot was originally a two-story structure, with the Harvey House Hotel on the top floor and a yardmaster and signal operator working on the bottom. The Harvey House was the first to close in 1932, and the depot followed it into history with the demise of passenger service and installation of CTC. The depot was raised in 1992, leaving Tehachapi as the only depot left standing along the subdivision. The south end of Mojave Yard is used as a lead track for UP local crews drilling the yard. With the sightings at Ansel and South Mojave being used as extra storage for flat switching, BNSF trains entering the Mojave subdivision must wait for both UP mainline traffic and local crews before making a run at the pass. The second unit on this local is an SD-59MX, one of 28 rebuilt SD-60M units that was delivered in 2012 to Union Pacific. EMD classified these units as SD32 ECOs, denoting the unit's Tier 2 compliant emission systems, and UP primarily assigned them to work locals in the Roseville area, though the class makes occasional forays to Mojave for local work. The junction with the Santa Fe was originally a mile north of here, but the building of the overpass for California Highway 14 caused the tracks to be moved south to avoid an at-grade crossing. With the completion of this overpass and three overpasses on Highway 58 in the pass itself, there exists no at-grade crossings of major highways onto Hatchapi, which significantly reduces the likelihood of train-on-car collisions. Another southbound heads under the Highway 14 overpass. The second unit is a rebuilt Dash 840BW, the freight version of the Dash 832BWH we saw trailing on the Coast Starlight at Rowan. Once common power on Santa Fe's 991 and 199 trains between Richmond and Chicago, the 500 series units remaining on BNSF's roster have been relegated to yard and local service. From the overpass, northbound BNSF trains can be seen sneaking their way through the S-curve at South Mojave to join onto the UP main. From here, trains are visible in the distance receiving their set of helpers from Sanborn, and the astute railfan can use this knowledge to plan out a chase for the train over the pass. Southbounds exiting Mojave leave town in the shadow of the Alta Wind Energy Farm, currently the third largest onshore wind farm in the world. This was the original SP line that stretched across the Mojave to Waterman Junction, later renamed to Barstow, and Needles. While SP trains never regularly traveled over the Santa Fe line to Barstow before the UP merger, SP on multiple occasions had opportunities to travel east to Mojave. In the early 1960s, SP considered several avenues for relieving congestion in the Los Angeles area, including trackage rights on the Santa Fe to Jim Gray, with a new line built between there and the Cajon Pass line at Oro Grande. Santa Fe chose to not pursue this line, and SP instead built the Palmdale cutoff to West Colton. But during the 1980s, it appeared as if Southern Pacific trains would once again use the Mojave subdivision east of Mojave to Barstow, when the Santa Fe offered to merge with it, shocking the railroad industry. Concerns from the Interstate Commerce Commission over the potential monopolization of trackage in the San Joaquin Valley in Texas prevented the merger from taking place. Southern Pacific was ultimately bought by investor Philip Anschultz, who then sold it in 1996 to Union Pacific. This rendered the SPSF paint scheme, dubbed Kodachrome for its similarities to the Kodak film box colors, a moot point, and most Santa Fe engines were repainted within a few years of the ICC striking the merger down. 
SP was left bereft of resources and most of its non-rail assets after Santa Fe jettisoned it, and thus could not afford to repaint every Kodachrome unit, even in the Anschultz era. East of Sanborn, BNSF trains skirt the edge of Edwards Air Force Base as they begin the trip across the desert to Barstow. While the desert is on average less taxing on motive power than the mountains behind it, the terrain is not flat, and trains must work hard through the hogbacks here as they continue their eastbound journey. With the entire Mojave Desert in front of them, trains working through Sanborn to Bissell and Boron are able to stretch their legs. Indeed, being free of the mountains behind them means that the Mojave subdivision takes on a faster, aggressive nature that is sure to impress visiting rail fans. And sure, the desert scenery has its charms, but there's nothing like the high horsepower action we've experienced all along to Hatchapi Pass. <laughs> Thank you. 